Well, good morning and welcome to Matins on this Wednesday of the seventh week of Easter. Thank you for being with me today. I do apologize for the delay. Still catching up from my short time away. I appreciate your flexibility. I hope you were able to keep up with the readings, um, which puts us to where we are today for the readings. So our readings today are Psalm 99. We're going to skip ahead a little bit and move into Ezekiel chapter 11, and uh, but we're moving steady through Hebrews, so today we're going to begin Hebrews chapter 7. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Would you please pray with me? Blessed Lord, you speak to us through the Holy Scriptures. Grant that we may hear, read, respect, learn, and make them our own in such a way that the enduring benefit and comfort of the word will help us grasp and hold the blessed hope of everlasting life given us through our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. <clears throat> o Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall declare your praise. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia! The Lord is risen indeed. O come, let us worship him. Alleluia! O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout for joy to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving, and raise a loud shout to him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God, and a great King above all gods. In his hand are the caverns of the earth. The heights of the hills are also his. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands have molded the dry land. O come, let us bow down and bend the knee and kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. The Lord is risen indeed. O come, let us worship him. Alleluia. All right. So that takes us to our song. Psalm number 99. The Lord is king. Let the people tremble. He is enthroned upon the cherubim. Let the earth shake. The Lord is great in Zion. He is high above all peoples. Let them confess his name, which is great and awesome. He is the Holy One. O mighty King, lover of justice, you have established equity. You have executed justice and righteousness in Jacob. Proclaim the greatness of the Lord our God and fall down before his footstool. He is the Holy One. Moses and Aaron among his priests, and Samuel among those who call upon his name. They called upon the Lord, and he answered them. He spoke to them out of the pillar of cloud. They kept his testimonies and the decree that he gave them. O Lord our God, you answered them indeed. You were a God who forgave them, yet punished them for their evil deeds. Proclaim the greatness of the Lord our God and worship him upon his holy hill. For the Lord our God is the Holy One. Let us pray. Lord our God, King of the universe, you love what is right. Lead us in your righteousness that we may live to praise you. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. <coughs> Our first reading then is from Ezekiel chapter 11. We'll read verses 14 through 25. <clears throat> and the word of the Lord came to me, says Ezekiel. Son of man, your brothers, even your brothers, your kinsmen, the whole house of Israel, all of them, are those of whom the inhabitants of Jerusalem have said, go far from the Lord. To us, this land is given for a possession. Therefore, say, thus says the Lord God, 
though I removed them far off among the nations, and though I scattered them among all among the countries, yet I have been a sanctuary to them for a while in the countries where they have gone. Therefore say, thus says the Lord God, I will gather you from the peoples and assemble you out of the countries where you have been scattered, and I will give you the land of Israel. And when they come there, they will remove from it all its detestable things and all its abominations. And I will give them one heart and a new spirit I will put within them. I will remove the heart of stone from their flesh and give them a heart of flesh, that they may walk in my statutes and keep my rules and obey them. And they shall be my people, and I will be their God. But as for those whose heart goes after their detestable things and their abominations, I will bring their deeds upon their own heads, declares the Lord God. Then the cherubim lifted up their wings with the wheels beside them, and the glory of God was over them. And the glory of the Lord went up from the midst of the city and stood on the mountain that is on the east side of the city. And the Spirit lifted me up and brought me in the vision by the Spirit of God into Chaldea to the exiles. Then the vision that I had seen went up from me, and I told the exiles all the things that the Lord had shown me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Okay, so uh, the first part of this of this chapter, chapter 11, um, uses a metaphor of Jerusalem as a cooking pot with meat inside, and God contradicts the inhabitants' arrogant self-assurance that the city walls will protect, will protect them. Um, they, they just don't get it, right? They just think they're invincible. <clears throat> Ezekiel's outcry at the sudden death of someone named Pilatia, yeah, um, gave an occasion for the comforting gospel sermon that follows it, which is what we just read. That's a it is a it's a vision of God's grace, right? God certainly will not make full end of the remnant of Israel, but will provide salvation. Okay, so <clears throat> all right. They were taken away, they were conquered as part of God's wrath. And God says, even though I removed them far off from the promised land, among the nations, scattered among all the other countries around. I've still been a sanctuary to them in those countries where they've gone, right? God is still their sanctuary. Uh, so here's also this instruction here, right? The inhabitants of Jerusalem have said this, right? Go far from the Lord. Um uh, those who had not been exiled when they were conquered, some were left behind. They urged those who were exiled to forget about ever returning to Jerusalem and worshiping the God they had once worshiped there. Go far from the Lord. Right? So they're saying, the Lord let this happen, so there's no point in worshiping him anymore. Wow. They argue that their survival in Jerusalem proves that they are true heirs of the ancient promises. So they see this as a division in the, in the Hebrew people. You were sent away, so therefore you must not be the inheritors of, of that. These ones who were left behind were some of the ones that um, worshipped the false idols. If you remember back, I think, what was it, Jeremiah? Um, we were talking about God left some behind in Jerusalem. And they thought they were the, the ones who were being saved when actually they weren't. This is the same idea here. <clears throat> they interpret the physical presence in the Holy Land as a guarantee of security. This argument will reappear after the final destruction of the city in 587 B.C., which is interesting because the first deportation was 597. So it's only going to be 10 years. And that's 
not a long time when we're talking in terms of this story. <clears throat> so this is God's voice here, right? And he is saying, this is what some of the people are saying. So, so prophet, here's what I want you to say. Thus says the Lord God. This is how any prophet announces that he's bringing God's word, not his own. Right? I may have removed you and I may have scattered you, but I am still a sanctuary to them. They are not going to go far from me. They're going to be with me in sanctuary. I'm giving them, like, think Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, right? All of them. They trusted in the Lord, even though they were far away. And because of that, remember, therefore, it tells you what it's there for. Say this, thus says the Lord God, I will gather you from the peoples. Typically, this means the nations, from the Gentiles, right? I will gather you. I will bring you out of them. I will assemble you, bring you together out of the countries where you've been scattered. So I sent you away. Now I'm going to bring you back. You were scattered. I'll bring you back together. I will give you the land of Israel, you who were faithful in far off lands, right? And when they come here, they will remove from it all its detestable things and its abominations. These are idols and false gods, right? All those things that led to God's wrath. These faithful, this faithful remnant in the scattered, you know, um, in the dispersion, the scattering, they stayed faithful to God. They walked in his ways. They repented, turned to him. They're going to come back and get rid of all the stuff that led to God's wrath in the first place. God is saying in these verses, starting at 16, the future lies with those who have, like this, died in exile, not with those who have escaped with their present lives. God had not abandoned the exiles. The temple sanctuary in Jerusalem was inaccessible to those who had been exiled and would soon be destroyed, but God was not imprisoned in that place where he caused his name to dwell for a time. Wherever God's name is invoked in true faith, even by only two or three present, Matthew 18, verse 20, where two or three are gathered, right? There is a little church. <laughs> All right. Hmm. So, and I will give, and when they remove from the land of Israel, the false gods and idols, I will give them one heart and a new spirit I will put within them. This is an interesting verse. All right. The Holy Scriptures do not credit the human powers of the natural free will with conversion, faith in Christ, regeneration, renewal, and all that belongs to their effective beginning and end. They do not credit free will, the whole way, halfway, or in any way, even in the smallest or most trivial way. The Holy Scriptures credit conversion solely and completely to the Holy Spirit's divine work. Reason and free will are able to live an outwardly decent life to a certain extent, but the Holy Spirit causes a person to be born anew and to have inwardly another heart, mind, and natural desire. The Holy Spirit opens the mind and heart to understand the scriptures and listen to the word. That's from the formula of Concord, the solid declaration. We don't read that one very often. All right. So, I will give them one heart and a new spirit. Heart of stone, a heart, a hardened heart. And from their flesh, I give them a heart of flesh way it's supposed to be and with that heart of flesh they can obey god walk in my statutes keep my rules and obey them they shall be my people and i will be their god which is the whole point this is what god wants for them and for us but as for those whose heart goes after their detestable things and abominations i will bring their deeds upon their own heads in other words they will suffer the consequences of their sin God is a just God. <clears throat> so, remember the future lies with the exiles here, 
not with those who were spared by the conquerors. Then the cherubim lifted up their wings with the wheels beside them. Remember, this was a vision, right? And this right here is the climax of the last three chapters, 9, 10, 11. The glory finally abandoned Jerusalem and the temple, which no longer had any special promise of divine protection. Jerusalem was as vulnerable as any other city. All right. Um, right. The glory of the God of Israel was over all of this, not confined in the temple. And the glory of the Lord went up from the midst of the city and stood on the mountain that is on the east side of the city. So that is, and it explains it here, across the Kidron Valley to the Mount of Olives. In chapter 43, the glory returns by the east gate to a new temple and a new Jerusalem in a new world. All right. So now this, the spirit lifted me up, me being Ezekiel, brought him in the vision into Chaldea. To the, this is where his body was the whole time. Okay, this is where he is. He is, that's where Ezekiel actually is. The vision was elsewhere. And the vision I had seen went up from me. Out of his trance-like state and back to his natural senses, basically. And then when the vision is over, Ezekiel tells the elders what he had seen and heard on his journey in the spirit. Right? I told the exiles. So he did exactly what God told him and showed him. All right. And that, whew, we're going to skip ahead tomorrow to chapter 18. So if you want to read the in-between chapters, it might be helpful. Uh, okay, now let's do Hebrews. All right, so today's reading, we're starting chapter 7, um, verses 1 through 17. <clears throat> For this Melchizedek, king of, Salem, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. And to him, Abraham apportioned a tenth part of everything. He is first, by translation of his name, king of righteousness. Then he is also king of Salem, that is, king of peace. He is without father or mother or genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but resembling the Son of God, he continues a priest forever. See how great this man was, to whom Abraham the patriarch gave a tenth of the spoils? And those descendants of Levi, who received the priestly office, have a commandment in the law to take tithes from the people, that is, from their brothers, though these also are descended from Abraham. But this man who does not have his, his descent from them received tithes from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. It is beyond dispute that the inferior is blessed by the superior. In the one case, tithes are received by mortal men, but in the other case, by one of whom it is testified that he lives. One might even say that Levi himself, who receives tithes, paid tithes through Abraham, for he was still in the loins of his ancestor when Melchizedek met him. Now, if perfection had been attainable through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need would there have been for another priest to arise after the order of Melchizedek, rather than one named after the order of Aaron. For when there is a change in the priesthood, there is necessarily a change in the law as well. For the one of whom these things are spoken belongs to another tribe, from which no one has ever served at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord was descended from Judah, and in connection with that tribe, Moses said nothing about priests. This has become even more evident when another priest arises in the likeness of Melchizedek, who has become a priest, not on the basis of a legal requirement concerning bodily descent, but by the power of an indestructible life. For it is witnessed of him 
you're a priest forever, after the order of Melchizedek. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <coughs> All right. This is a this is going to be deep. Okay. So you have to remember the the story of Abraham meeting King Melchizedek, king of Salem. Salem in uh Hebrew, it, it looks very much like shalom, which is the word for peace, right? We see that here, king of peace, okay? Uh, let's, let's go over to the notes. King of Salem, all right. All right, so priest of the Most High God. So he is a priest of the God of Abraham, okay? He is a priest to that God. <clears throat> met Abraham returning from the slaughter of kings. All right, so Melchizedek was both priest and king at the same time, very unique in the story of God's people. As heirs of Abraham, those who trust in Christ share, oops, I'm sorry, I'm reading the wrong paragraph. His status as priest and king at the same time foreshadowed the unity of true kingship and priesthood, which is fulfilled in Christ. All right, Genesis 14, 18, Psalm 110, verse 4. Salem was an early name for the city of Jebus. The Most High God is another, another um, title for the one true God, the God of Abraham. All right, the slaughter of kings takes place in Genesis 14, 13 through 16. And he blessed him. This is a priestly action. Um, and so Abraham gave him a tenth of everything, right? Arguably the first tithe. He recognized Melchizedek's priestly status and offered him a tithe. Uh, in Hebrew, Melchizedek actually means king of righteousness, and king of Salem means king of peace. Even though that was a town name, it also means king of peace, right? And this is what this is described right here. By translation of his name, King of Righteousness, King of Peace. He has no father or mother or genealogy. Now that's interesting, at least not in the story as we read it. <clears throat> the validity of priestly descent had to be established before a priest could take office. So in Leviticus, in, let's see. In the in after the Exodus, as God is establishing his people through Moses, he tells Moses, Set your brother Aaron apart. He will be my priest. And everyone who comes from him, who comes after him, will be from his tribe, which is the tribe of Levi. Right? They are the holy class, they are the priestly class. So you in in the in the Mosaic law. And Torah, if you wanted to be a priest, you had to be from that tribe. That was how it started. All right. The chief Old Testament re reference to Melchizedek, Genesis 14, 18 to 20, says nothing of his lineage. <clears throat> Melchizedek, whom God appointed as a priest and king, foreshadows the divine eternal priesthood and kingship of Christ. Um. So God appointed him, even though he wasn't of that tribe, okay, because that tribe wasn't even established yet. Those descendants of Levi who received the priestly office have a commandment in the law. Oh, let me back up. So we don't know anything about when he was born nor when he died, but he appears to continue a priest forever, resembling the son of God, right? So that's very much like Christ, okay? And this is where. Um, this is where this, the author of Hebrews is trying to explain who Jesus of Nazareth is. And he's even, cause he didn't come from Le the, the tribe of Levi. He came from the tribe of Judah. Judah are not the tribe of priests, Levi, but here's a priest, not from that tribe, right? Look at the similarities to Melchizedek, right? How great this man was to whom Abraham the patriarch gave a tenth. Our patriarch Abraham gave Melchizedek a tenth of the spoils. 
Now, our normal priests receive the priestly office. They have a commandment in the law to take tithes from the people, that is, from their brothers. Though these are also descended from Abraham. All the other 11 tribes are descended from Abraham too. And they're supposed to give to this tribe. But this man, who does not have his descent from them, also received tribes from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. That's Abraham. So the tithes were not going to the Levites. The tithes were going to God. Both to the, the priests of Levi and Melchizedek, because they are ultimately giving it to God. It is beyond dispute that the inferior is blessed by the superior. Abraham is blessed by Melchizedek, right? Abraham is neither priest nor king. Patriarch, father of the family tree, but not priest and not king. In the one case, tithes are received by mortal men. But in the other case, by one of whom it is testified that he lives, right? We know these other priests died. Melchizedek, we don't. It, it appears he was a priest forever, by one of whom it is testified that he lives. One might even say that Levi himself, who receives tithes, paid tithes through Abraham. Now that's a little bit. He is the father of all Israelite priests. Priests paid a tithe to Melchizedek, the greater priest, through his ancestor Abraham. Right? Paid tithes through it. Since Abraham did it, and he is, Levi is Abraham's descendant, even Levi, in his history, through his great, 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 whatever grandfather, um, paid tithes to this other priest. Melchizedek is the superior priest. Because Levi was still in the loins of his ancestor when Melchizedek met Abraham. Okay? Melchizedek is the superior priest. He's also a king. So, and we have, we have to cover this down to 17, right? So, if perfection had been attainable through the Levitical priesthood, which is where the people received the law, the Levitical priests were the keepers of the law, and they taught the people the law. If they could have, if if the Hebrew people could have been perfected this way, why would there need to be another priest to arise after the order of Melchizedek, rather than one named after the order of Aaron, which is Levitical priesthood? Okay. These priests were established under Moses. Why would there need to be another one? Because they couldn't. Because they couldn't be perfected. Perfection was not attainable. Because people, by their nature, are sinful. And so God rose up another priest after the order of Melchizedek instead of the order of Aaron. When there's a change in priesthood, there's necessarily a change in the law as well. That's a powerful statement. The law stipulates the rituals and ceremonies of worship, and its fulfillment depended on the Levitical priesthood. So changing the priesthood means changing the nature of worship. That's deep. For the one of whom these things are spoken belonged to another tribe from which no one has ever served at the altar. Right? It's evident that our Lord was descended from Judah. And in connection with the tribe of Judah, Moses said nothing about priests. There were no priests from the tribe of Judah. Okay. So. How could he be a priest? Because this becomes even more evident when another priest arises in the likeness of Melchizedek, who has become a priest not on the basis of a legal requirement concerning bodily descent, which tribe he's from, but by the power of an indestructible life. For it is witnessed of him, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. This is Psalm 110 all the way back to David, referring to the Messiah. This emphasizes God's promise concerning the unending priesthood of Jesus. Christ glorified at the right hand of the Father. 
All right. And we will pick up right there tomorrow with verse 18 and get more of an explanation. All right. Let's conclude our liturgy. In many and various ways, God spoke to his people of old by the prophets. But now in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. This is the day the Lord has made. Alleluia. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Alleluia. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel. He has come to his people and set them free. He has raised up for us a mighty Savior, born of the house of his servant David. Through his holy prophets, he promised of old that he would save us from our enemies, from the hands of all who hate us. He promised to show mercy to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. This was the oath he swore to our father Abraham, to set us free from the hands of our enemies, free to worship him without fear, holy and righteous in his sight all the days of our life. You, my child, shall be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his way, to give his people knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sins. In the tender compassion of our God, the dawn from on high shall break upon us to shine on those who dwell in darkness and the shadow of death, and to guide our feet into the way of peace. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. This is the day the Lord has made. Alleluia. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Alleluia. Let us pray. God of mercy, unite your church in the Holy Spirit, that we may serve you with all our hearts, and work together with unselfish love. Grant this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. We give thanks to you, Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have protected us through the night from all danger and harm. We ask you to preserve and keep us this day also from all sin and evil, that in all our thoughts, words, and deeds, we may serve and please you. Into your hands we commend our bodies and souls, and all that is ours. Let your holy angels have charge of us, that the wicked one have no power over us. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now the Almighty and merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless and preserve you. Amen. And that concludes our matins for this Wednesday. Thank you for spending this time in the Word with me. And thank you for giving back to God a little bit of the day he's given to you. Um, I appreciate your flexibility for the first couple of days um, and we should be on track for the rest of the week. So uh, again, thank you for being here. I wish you a blessed rest of your day until we can be together again, whenever that is. May God bless and keep you. <laughs>